Hi. Um, so uh, my name's Tim. Um, I'm a technical director from from Forworks. Um, I'm actually from England, um, but I've lived in New York, so that's why I have this kind of weird accent. For, um, so let's just talk a little bit about uh, Fortworks. Um, who here kind of or is already aware? Who knows Fortworks? Yeah, okay. So um, if you don't know Fortworks, you probably know some of our uh, tools that we've built. Uh, we're actually kind of bad at marketing, and sometimes a lot of folks know some of the innovations that we've created. Um, so I just wanted to give you this sort of timeline Sort of like the key ones are at the beginning here with some of the first uh, con continuous integration servers were built by Fortworks. Um, and then obviously, I think everybody here probably knows the Selenium icon, I would hope. Um, some other things that are probably relevant to this audience, behavior-driven development came out from Dan North, who was a Fort Worker, um, Cucumber also. Um, and then m more recently, in the last sort of five years, the, the, the tech radar um, is very popular, um, and you can. That's kind of our opinion of the of tools and practices in in the, the industry, and uh, you can talk to me about that later. Uh, cool. All right. Um, we've been around for about twenty five years, and essentially a software development um, consultancy. So uh, I'm going to talk about automated testing a little bit. So. Quite often, we work with a lot of clients, um, and they are in kind of different stages of the testing journey. Um, and um, so maybe they would sort of uh, had a manual testing approach, um, and they're moving towards automated testing. Um, and you know, I think at this point, most are in in that direction. Uh, most companies are already, already going that way. Um, but these are some of the reasons why they tried to do it, right? So. We want to reduce the cost of quality assurance. Uh, we want to maybe reduce the number of functional and non-functional problems. Non-functional problem being something like performance or scalability or security. Um, maybe we want to increase productivity. And, and on the rare occasion, we actually might want to uh, make our users happy. Um, so, but, but actually what we find is sometimes we, we go to an organization and they've uh, invested a lot of money into automated testing. Um, but it, none of this is achieved. Uh, in Airtrack, sometimes a lot of it's got worse. Um, or actually, uh, sometimes there's a trade-off, right? So maybe we've got a little bit better at QA, but perhaps productivity's gone down, right? Um, so that's something we cheat. I'm not going to tell you how to fix all of this, um, but I, you know, what I'm going to talk about today about component testing, um, I'm not sure if my microphone's still working. Um, yep, definitely is, um, will help to fix some of these. So um, let's talk a bit more about the problem. So this is software design. Um, this is some kind of dependency graph, uh, maybe between services or modules, something like that. Does this look like your architecture? Pro probably not. Maybe it looks, maybe your architecture looks like this, yeah. Uh, so <laughs> how do you test this? And the clue is in the name of this room. Uh, so <laughs> so you, you, yeah, nobody can understand this. It, it's hard to reason about. Um, so what does a QA department do? Uh, they, they create a black box. And, and then on top of that black box, uh, we put an end-to-end -end test. And most of our quality assurance is done through testing for a user interface, maybe testing through some other interface, so like maybe a, a database or some other kind of messaging uh, protocol. Um, and then you know, this leads to very long build times, right? An end-to-end -end test is by its nature, because it's end-to-end, -end, it tests every layer, so therefore the tests are slow, um, and it leads to these long builds. Um, but we're going to come back to that in a little bit. Um, but I want to talk about why, does, why do fast builds matter? Um, so a lot of what we do at Fullworks is try to make uh, engineering departments better at delivering software. Right? I don't know if anybody's read the State of DevOps report or Accelerate. Um, they talk about uh, sort of four key metrics. Um, and when we're working with an organization, we like, you know, we, we like to use data. So any kind of innovation or any kind of practice that we're introducing, the idea is to, um, to improve these metrics that I've got up here, right? And you know, the State of DevOps report basically identified four key metrics that are linked to being better at delivering software. So by that, what we're kind of inferring from that is that if we improve these metrics, that engineering organization should be better at delivering software. Not as quite as simple as that, but, but it, it, it gets us somewhere. Um, so, so some of the metrics we talk about here is sort of mean time to recovery, um, 
the, the time for first check-in, so that's like the bootstrapping, uh, the time from um, you know, making a, uh, making a, ch a developer sort of finish their story to checking in and that actually being in production. Um, and then, you know, there's maybe the, the time to actually validate a, a local change. Um, uh, this is already an interesting one. I call that like the death by a thousand paper cuts. If you have a five minute time to, to, to validate, validate your local change. Um, so, so with these metrics, like typically we might start, uh, with the organization might start with a metric on the left and then over, uh, you know, it, it's, it's not something you can solve the next day, but maybe over a year or two, you, you get towards the metric on the right, um, and they're therefore creating a, a high-performance team. Um, now, but we're already talking about automated testing. Um, automate and, the, and the automated testing part of the build, that does affect a lot of these metrics, right? In particular, the uh, check into production ready, in particular, the time to validate the change, um, obviously, the change failure rate. Um, so. In actual fact, the automated testing build is a large part of affecting the, the productivity of, of the team um, and you know, being better at, at delivering software. Um, if we want to get to this kind of fast feedback um, and this, this state of flow. Um, so just quickly show uh, a build pipeline. Um, this is probably a, this is not the worst one I've seen, but it's not a good one. Um, so, uh, so, Maybe you've got like a build and test pipeline, um, takes about 30, 30 minutes, that's just building the code and running unit tests. Um, perhaps you've got a deployment pipeline, takes about 15. Um, and then, you know, obviously the worst offender at the bottom is this sort of end-to-end -end regression test. Uh, this is two hours, this is probably on the average. I think sometimes we've seen half a day, I think I've seen two days as the worst, probably. Um, and in the best situation, um, you know, Seven minutes is probably some of our really high performant, um, really high performant teams is, is getting towards. Um, the other, the other problem with this is quite often they are. This is not one pipeline; it's three pipelines um, in, in an anti-pattern, um, and so that often there's 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 extra pauses that happens between these pipelines, right? So, um, so for example, the regression test might run not on every check-in, it might run on every day, uh, those kind of things. So there's, there's extra pauses there. Um, I, I, was, I guess I was curious, is, is this uh, worse than your situation? Yeah, worse or better than your situation? Better, okay, so some have, wor some have worse ones, all right, okay. So I, I guess I got the average, perhaps. Um, so some of the other anti-patterns we see, um, I'm sure you, everybody knows about these. Um, yeah, so we talked about the separate pipelines. Um, flaky tests, fails one in five. Um, we, <laughs> we deploy without, even with those tests failing. Um, uh, sometimes we, we have a, a green, um, we have a, a great automated test suite. Um, but we have a low quality software, <laughs> so it, it still breaks in production. Um, and then the very common one is just the, the actual QA environment or, or the QA, the, the test suite itself is, is kind of broken. Um, so so that, that test suite is not providing any real value, um, especially if you hit all of these. Um, uh, so this is a shape uh, that I'm not going to talk about, but I think everybody knows uh, what this represents, and I'm sure you've yeah, you've got it memorized. You've probably got a picture on your wall, and yeah. But I, I will talk about this 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 one. So this is uh, what we see quite a lot. Um, I don't know what sh what shape is this. It's like an hourglass, maybe, or maybe sort of a, a bow tie or something. Uh, but uh, so this is, and it talks about kind of like the um, transformation that a company's gone on. Um, quite often. If a company is getting much more serious about code quality, they um, start to write a lot of unit tests. Um, so the engineers start to write a lot of unit tests. Uh, similarly, the QA department, okay, we're no longer going to do manual QA. We, we're going we're gonna to write a lot of, uh, so we're going to write a lot of automated tests. Um, perhaps, but perhaps we haven't really adjusted the way we think about requirements and things like that. So we end up just, you know, recreating our manual te test specs in in kind of automated. Um, so this this really, you know, it's 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 kind of a reflection of the organizational structure um, and the fact that you know they moved on a DevOps journey on an automated testing journey, but they haven't changed the organizational structure and the, there's still this kind of silos and lack of communication. 
Um, and, and then there's a lack of anything in the middle, right? So there's these two kind of test suites, um, and then there's nothing really in the middle. And quite often, you know, the developers are, are writing unit tests, but they may not really care about quality. They're just trying to hit a coverage number. That's, a, that's another thing we see is uh, um, they're still relying on that QA department to find their bugs. Um, and, the, you know, and if they were thinking more about, like, well, how do I actually prove that my software is high quality, then they would actually be creating more service-based tests. Um, but anyway, we're going to talk about that kind of middle, middle part of it. Um, which uh, I'm using a kind of very generic term called component testing. Um, so let's go back to this software, right? So this is how uh, a lot of architectures are today. Um, but there is hope. You know, um, a lot of companies are trying to create architectures that look like this. Um, I don't exactly know why. I mean, I think a lot of the patterns and practices that create a good decoupled architecture and good separation of concerns have existed for 20 years, but perhaps now companies are starting to realize that that's uh, a differentiator, um, especially with the kind of microservice movement. Um, so perhaps there is no longer this tangled mess, um, and perhaps we have this, this decoupled architecture where I have these separate components and I, have, I can reason about what is happening in each part of my application. And each part of my application has, you know, it does one thing, and it does that one thing well. Hopefully. Um, so, but, <laughs> so again, same kind of problem. Um, the engineering department is getting better at writing microservices, but has the QA department come along for the ride? Perhaps, perhaps on, in, in a high-performing environment, um, but, but quite often we see this. So we've created, we've created this decoupled architecture, but we still have this long end-to-end -end test suite. We're still testing microservice, microservices through, uh, through this, this long um, Selenium-based end-to-end testing suite. Um, so I guess my hypothesis is why shouldn't it look a bit more like this? Um, so you know, we test each component individually, um, we, you know, each component has a well-defined uh, API. Um, it has a well-defined you know, purpose, um, and we know what that purpose is, uh, and we test it individually. Um, and then the idea being that, you know, if each component works individually, then all I really need to do is make sure the components talk to each other correctly, uh, and I don't need those end-to-end -end tests. Uh, okay, so let's talk about what. Uh, what, what is a component? Um, so I've already mentioned a microservice being one example, um, but I do want to make the point here that it, it doesn't have to be that way. Um, we actually work with uh, quite a lot of monolithic applications um, that uh, deploy to production um, you know, 20 times a day. Right? So I work with a, a code base that has uh, like 4 million lines of code, um, yeah, and, and going from a check-in to being in production takes 30 minutes. Um, and there's a lot of uh, parallelization going on in that build, and a lot of that's done through component testing, um, and, and it's because they have a decoupled uh, design, but it doesn't necessarily have to be microservice, right? It can be um, a module, it can be a, an abstraction in your code, um, but, but it's a, that decoupled design has allowed me to create a test around it and to get that, um, that assurance, that confidence that it's going to work, but also run really, really quickly. Um, so other components, uh, yes, uh, you know, everybody's very serious about uh, data lakes uh, and building data platforms at the moment, so a transformation step in a, in a data, data pipeline, a third-party service. Um, I'm going to talk later on about UI components. Um, I think the other movement we're seeing is really, really good um, JavaScript frameworks have a really good separation of concern. So if you're using Angular or React, they talk to an API. Uh, that, they have, um, that API you know, is how they get the business logic. Um, so I can test that UI layer by itself a as a component, and I don't, I don't actually need to you know, test the UI through an end-to-end -end test. And we, we're going to talk about that a little bit. Um, so this is kind of my hypothesis. So if we end up with this approach, essentially what we, we do is we put um, a lot of the component testing, a lot of the edge cases, um, a lot of the functionality is tested there. Um, so then what do I do with my end-to-end -end test? Um, I'm going to be doing sort of uh, critical path testing. Um, so like in an e-commerce uh, website, 
um, yeah, the, certain, the, the critical path is like, if this feature fails, uh, we go out of business, right? So, so you, 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 you probably want to do a checkout or something in an e-commerce website or a search or something like that. You, you should always test that. Um, and then the integration between the components. Um, and then, of course, you need some way of making sure that it is, it's configured in, in, in the different environments. Um, I, I will say that there are other ways other than end-to-end -end tests to test these things, um, but that's not the subject of this talk. So uh, let's quickly define what a component is. Um, I think it's, I think it's, I think everybody kind of knows, but it's it's this sort of uh, yeah, very generic here. But it, it's it's a <clears throat> a box, a boundary, some code, some dependencies. So typically, it's your dependencies are going to be a database, um, a file system, some external or internal APIs. Um, but the import the important part here is that I have a boundary, and I have a clearly well defined API. Um, and that API allows me to write tests on, right? I'm not exposing the internals of, of, of my component. Um, so we're quickly going to talk about uh, how might we test a component. Um, so uh, one way, obviously, is what I describe as out of process. Um, so that would be through, um, through an API, typically through a, a REST API. Um, you may decide to stub external dependencies um, using uh, Monty Bank or uh, Wymock or something like that. Um, I, I would say um, for the, there's always an interesting question is what to stub and what not to stub. I think typically we would start with all the services that we control, um, we would probably actually um, integrate with to begin with. Um, but then over time, you might start to introduce more stubbing. Um, with an in process test, test um, and I'm going to explain a little bit what I mean by an in-process test a bit later on. Um, but it's, it's this idea that I, I can test a, uh, an abstraction, a class, um, and it represents a large amount of business logic. Um, and I don't necessarily have to test like the controller. It's sort of one example, right? I, do I really need to retest controllers all the time, or could I just you know, test an abstraction in my, my code base that represents the business logic? Um, so in this situation, my test is written in the same language. It's run in memory. Um, and um, I'm going to, I could do the same thing. I could still stub using an external virtualization. Or um, I could use an in-memory stub. Um, so those are kind of the approaches there. Um, every presentation needs a contrived example. So here is mine. Um, this, uh, OK, ignore my terrible user experience. Um, I'm a developer. Uh, so this, this is, but it represents you know, some parameters that go into a service, and I spit out some result, right? So um, there's some business logic here. It, it's calculating a, a, a charge for a, a service that I'm paying for. So, um, but it's, it's, as I said, it's a contrived example. Um, this is my uh, very, very simple uh, architecture. Um, so I have a React app, a uh, Node app, and and um, um, if you don't know what a BFF is, that is a backend for a front end. Um, it came out of Netflix. You can Google it. It's it's a it's a way of of creating a view for uh, different um, uh, for for different devices, right? So you might create a view for a mobile device, a view for an IoT device, a view for uh, a desktop device. Um, uh, I think uh, nowadays people use GraphQL for uh, similar similar kind of functionality, um, and then I have my charge service and my um, another service. Um, so let's start with the the end to end test. Um, this is Tyco. <laughs> Probably you don't know Tyco yet. I think there is a talk to, uh, today or tomorrow about Tyco. Um, it's coming out of Fortworks soon. It's it is actually. Um, Despite this being a kind of an anti-end-to-end -end test, it is a new framework for writing end-to-end -end tests. Um, the big difference is there's no selectors. Um, so it, it's, it's much better for uh, somebody that doesn't know the internals of the application. So a lot of what you're seeing there are labels that's actually being displayed. Um, there's, a few, there's a lot of other things. It's kind of based on the same te technology as Puppeteer, but it's a bit higher level. It's a bit more designed for writing tests rather than just automation. Um, uh, the other thing about it is you, it, it will wait. I don't have to, um, you know, I've actually got some Ajax going on here between the submit and the assertion at the end, um, but it, it, it automatically does that, so you don't have to do that yourself. So it's, it's kind of a, a, cleaner, a cleaner test. Um, 
But as I say, go maybe uh, check out the talk that's there today, I think. Okay, so let's start with, um, uh, the other point I wanted to point out here is uh, this is probably going to run in about 1.2 seconds, sort of 800 milliseconds, something like that. Um, you know, this, it's obviously a contrived example, but it, I think comparatively, um, it's sort of a good representation. Um, so now let's move down to the uh, writing and sort of an out of process test. Um, these code examples are purely to make it easier for me to talk about it. About it. Um, it's not, I don't, I'm not suggesting you should write all your tests in JavaScript or TypeScript. Um, don't criticize my code. Um, so, <laughs> so, uh, but it's just, it's just to, to give you a, a, an example, right? So this, so in this situation, I'm calling a uh, an endpoint. It's an out of process test, uh, but I'm doing, you know, I'm testing the same functionality, right? Um, quite often, this is going to be done with rest assured. Um, it could be done. Um, you could use a BD framework for this, a BDD framework. Um, often, we would probably. Um, abstract out the kind of calling of the REST API and have it written in the terms of the business language, um, especially if you're using a BDD kind of format. Um, so uh, but it's going to run, again, comparatively, maybe it runs in about 50 milliseconds, something like that. Um, uh, there is one point here that, that's, that's probably worth pointing out is that I am saying that it, you know, the, one of the points of a component test is that it should run in your development or your local environment. It's actually a good way of driving out your, your dev environment, right? If I can write a test that ensures that all my, the pieces that I control um, work together, that's actually a good way of, of forcing you to create a useful development environment. Um, okay, so now let's look at that kind of in-process test. Um, oh, so this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is not the test, this is the actual uh, application server code. It's missing a lot of stuff, uh, missing validation, missing error handling. Um, but the point I'm trying to raise here is that um, I don't know if everybody uh, is using the MVC pattern. Um, I'm sure that probably one of the massive, the massive anti-patterns with the MVC pattern is um, anemic uh, models and fat controllers, right? So there's a lot of, you, you probably see a lot of code bases where you have a lot of logic in the controller itself. Um, what that means is I, it means it's much more difficult to test. Right? Um, if I can push that logic into a good abstraction, um, in this situation, I'm using an application service kind of abstraction. So that, that, that charge service is going to call into my domain model. Um, and it, it means that my controller can stay fairly clean. Um, and it also means that um, I can write a test around it. Um, there probably would also have to be some dependencies here that I'd be passing into it. Um, so looking at the test, it looks very similar to the previous one. The difference is that it's, it's in, um, in memory. I'm not calling um, a REST API. And uh, yeah, and then uh, I'm, I'm asserting the result. Um, so let's take a look quickly at why, which approach should you pick. Um, I think it's fairly obvious. You know, the in-process is the fastest, but it's not going to test everything, so you don't test the, uh, the, the different layers. Um, and the out-of-process one is going to still be fast, but you are testing some of the boilerplate, right? I'm going to test <coughs> does express do what it's meant to do, right? And I, um, all over again. Um, the other nice thing about maybe the, the, the out-of-process test is that if you, and this is what a lot of companies are doing, they're actually standardizing on an API ecosystem. Um, so if you're actually uh, if forcing out all your business logic and all your capabilities to be in the form of an API, you know, maybe your testing approach can actually drive that out, right? So that's, that's one, one thing to think about. Um, so I want to show you a, a better looking build. Um, we, uh, we're very big on continuous delivery at Fortworks. Uh, the book was written by a Fort worker. Um, we believe that the, uh, the pipeline um, should flow all the way from check-in to production um, completely um, with, uh, you know, there might be one or two manual steps, but that manual step would just be click, uh, deploy. And, and that, that is how we structure our pipelines. Um, we, you know, we don't believe any code is, is valuable or it's done until it hits production. Um, so this is maybe a, a better kind of uh, build. Um, we're also really big on uh, what's described as fan out and fan in. So this is, a bit, this is an example of a fan out and a fan in. So you're fanning out in this kind of third stage here um, because I've, you know, I've isolated all my tests and I can run them uh, in parallel. 
Um, just to give you sort of a, an example, the, the one of the clients I work with, uh, it's, it's a very extreme e version of this, um, but they they go from check into production in, in 30 minutes, which they're unhappy about, um, and that runs about, f um, and the actual build part, that kind of orange part, will run in about seven minutes, um, but that is parallelized over about 60 workers. So they, they've written um, <clears throat> they've written their tests in a way uh, uh, that, that they, they're isolated and go, can go across. Uh, okay, so um, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit. I'm running out of time. Um, so let's talk. Uh, so one of, the, one of the other problems is um, if you have a uh, engineering department and a QA department that are siloed, how, how do I find that place to actually write my test? I mean, that's kind of one of the problems. It's like, yes, I'd like to do this, um, and, and what I'm describing is not rocket science. It's a very, very simple kind of thing, but but I just don't have that option to actually write that test. Um, and a lot of that is about communication. A lot of that is about you know thinking about testability as being a feature of my application. Right? The, it's 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 amazing how reluctant teams are to change code to make it testable, but yet they're spending so much money on writing tests, but oh no, you can't touch the code to make it testable, no. So, um, so there's a lot of so, some things here. So I, if you don't know domain-driven design, um, I'm not going to go into it too much, but it's, it's a nice way of talking about what, is, what does my system do rather than you know, uh, the user experience and things like that. Um, and if you adopt domain-driven design, um, it should make your code much more testable. OK. Um, I'm going to quickly talk about UI testing. Um, and then we'll wrap it up. So I said earlier, if you're using um, React Angular Vue, um, you're naturally going to be decoupled. So I can kind of take this approach, right, where I can stub up my API, maybe Montebank, and I can write. This would probably still be driven by Tyco or Selenium or something like that. But it, you know, with some of these uh, frameworks coming out, I do I do have the ability to write a um, in-process test. Um, the same is also with with mobile. Um, you can do the same with a, a Robo Electric, I think. Um, just to give you an example of this, um, I'm going to let this, this this slide will be available so you can look at it. I realize I'm rushing through these slides pretty quickly, um, but you know, in this example, what I'm actually doing is I'm I'm rendering my Re React application, um, and I'm you know I'm I'm doing what that Selenium test did, right? So I'm I'm filling in my inputs, I'm submitting it. Um, and then I'm checking uh, on, uh, on the result here. Um, so, uh, Forex wrote Selenium 15 years ago, right? And 15 years ago, um, you had IE6. 15 years ago, people were adopting jQuery, right? If you use a, a modern UI framework like React or, or Angular or Vue, in theory, you know, for the most part, it's going to work across browser, right? Uh, uh, there's a lot of stuff that's just going to work that I don't need to retest. You know, tr but trying to get the QA department to, to, to build this trust, um, it can be difficult, um, for sure. Um, but I, but I, th I think it, it, it can make the test run a lot faster, right? I don't, I don't, I don't really need a Selenium test to do this. It's, it's doing the exact same thing. Um, anyway, let's move on. Um, so... There is some weird ass code that I had to write to make this this work, um, and I, I will share it with you. But it's just some JavaScript magic, um, and I'll, I'll share that with you later. So I think um, I've alluded to it a couple of times, but how did we end up? I mean, I've been talking about architecture and design and tests, but how do we end up like this? Um, it isn't really about that. It's about this, right? It's about culture, right? So how do? <laughs> and the, the culture is is that so I'm introducing all these new practices and everyone likes to talk about tools. They like I've mentioned a whole bunch of tools and I'm sure everybody took photos of them. But um, but really, like what you need to change is is the culture. And I'm sure there's talks about it here. But I I can't step away from this presentation without talking about the need to change that. So um, so here's some of the, some some principles that uh, we sort of go by at Fortworks. Um, uh, I, again, this would be a whole presentation on this kind of thing, but I'm sure you've heard this this before. Um, but you know, these are some of the very important um, aspects that 
principles is that quality is everybody's responsibility. Everyone should know uh, what my user thinks of the application. We should have cross-functional teams that work together. We should design our application to be testable. Um, you know, it, it, it's, it's OK to change the code so it makes it more testable. Um, think about testing from the beginning. And then continuous improvement, right? So a lot of the stuff I'm talking about, you don't start with. Um, I didn't. I don't start with this kind of like a gazillion in-process tests. I, I start with my end-to-end -end tests, but over time, I'm doing my post-mortems. I'm doing my retrospectives. My QAs and my engineers are coming together, you know. And, and instead of like, oh, we had this problem, let's add a whole bunch of end-to-end -end tests. I'm saying, how do I how do I design my code? How do I make it more testable? How do I make it more resilient? Um, and that's the aspect of continuous improvement there. Um, and this is my the summary of what I just talked about. Um, Again, so end-to-end -end test versus components, so test, test the functionality through the component, integration through the end-to-end -end test, uh, types of components, it isn't just a microservice, you don't, I see a lot of companies going to microservices just to get a faster build. You, you don't need to do that, you, there are other ways. Um, uh, in process fastest, um, and then we talked about DDD and, and talking uh, as being an important thing, um, and then, yeah, culture is trust, communication, and, and continuous improvement. That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have time exactly for one question. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, ho I hope it's a good one. Uh, since you're uh, concentrating on component tests, uh, basically uh, to write less than to end tests, do you couple them with also with contract tests between the component or something like that? <coughs> um, uh, so yes, we do. Um, you, so we need to make sure that the components can talk to each other. Um, <coughs> we can do the end-to-end -end test. We'll do that. And I'm not saying we shouldn't write end-to-end -end tests. We would typically do a flow-based test that makes sure that, that the components will talk to each other. And that's a reasonable way. Um, as a company becomes, as you get more mature, um, I'm just being a bit conservative because I, I think sometimes uh, we, we jump to c contract tests. Um, we, you know, uh, if you're getting more mature, you're having lots of teams, lots of APIs, you might start to look at um, things like uh, consumer-driven uh, contracts, um, PACT, and, and contract tests like that. Um, I also think that... Um, uh, observability is very important as well. So uh, I haven't talked about it here, but having health checks in my application that are actual, real, not just giving 200s, but saying, does this service work? Can it talk to other services? Does it actually do what it's meant to do? Uh, does it do a, a search? Uh, so sometimes we actually see more... I, sometimes I recommend improving the observability and monitoring in production before I resort to something like consumer-driven contracts and things like that. Um, but, but certainly, it, it's an important technique. Cool. Thanks again. Uh, cheers. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>